Mike Ehrmantraut has to be the crowning jewel of Vince Gilligan's franchise of chemistry teachers turned kingpins and criminal lawyers. Now the gag is going to come off, and I need to ask you a question, and I need you to answer it quietly. Got it? Born out of a literal scheduling conflict, the stoic, stony-eyed enforcer of Gus Fring has helped revitalize the stellar career of Jonathan Banks, and every moment we spend with Lalo's favorite bald gringo is a true pleasure. If you were going to die, you'd be dead already. Now step out of the truck, we got things to do. But Mike from Breaking Bad and Mike from Better Call Saul are two different people, and while the latter tells the story of how Jimmy McGill became Saul Goodman, we'd argue that Mike serves as the deuteragonist of the whole show, and that it tells his story as much as it does Jimmy's. But who exactly was Mike before he came a part of Gus Fring's inner circle and Saul Goodman's guy who knows a guy? You know someone like that? Let's just say I know a guy who knows a guy. Why did he end up joining these crooked personalities in the first place? And is his integrity as unshakable as he says it is? We'll answer all those questions and more. This is Mike Ehrmantraut's Origins Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. He's the guy who fixes things but can't fix his own problems. The cleaner Mike Ehrmantraut in Breaking Bad. Mike saunters into our lives as a no-nonsense all-business fixer in the season 2 finale of Breaking Bad titled ABQ. After Jesse's will to live is completely shattered by Jane's death, he calls Walt to help him figure this whole thing out. Walt then calls Saul, who calls Mike, and the cleaner shows up at Jesse's house as a rather unassuming old man. But the instant we see Mike get to work, we know that this is a man who doesn't mess about. Mike surgically cleans up the entire scene and coaches Jesse through what he should tell the paramedics when they show up. He disappears and reappears every now and then across Season 3, working primarily at Saul's private investigation until it's very clearly established that Mike is the link between Saul and Gus, as the former tells Walter he that he knows a guy who knows a guy who might be able to help him solve his distribution woes. Mike gets a far more expanded role from that season onward as well, as he is the man responsible for saving Walt's life from the cousins, whom we did a video on as well, that you should totally check out, and finishing him off as well on strict orders from Gus. The trap is set. Salamanca shows up. He goes down. Perhaps Mike's most badass venture that shows his skills as a cleaner on full display is when he protects Chow from cartel hitmen by wiping them out single-handedly. He then presses Chow for intel on just who these guys were, and realizes that the cartel is hitting Gus back for getting two of their own killed. But Mike remains composed and level-headed as he prepares for the war that is to come. This is Mike's defining character trait. He is the voice of reason in heated scenarios and usually has 12 plans up his sleeve to get out of any situation he might be in. Mike is exceptionally good at his job, and has a strong sense of honor that everyone he works with begrudgingly respects. But Mike's fatal flaw is thinking that everyone sees the world the way he does. Dependable. She has a Camry. Good. We get a beautiful scene between him and Walt in Season 3, Episode 12, where Mike recounts his past as a beat cop to this meth-cooking genius, and draws an analogy between his former career and Walter's current situation. Mike tells him a story about an alcoholic and his wife, and how the alcoholic would frequently abuse her, only to be thrown into the drunk tank, and be out on the streets the very next day. One day, Mike had enough, and when his partner wasn't with him, he took the guy out into the middle of nowhere and beat him up threatening to kill him. Instead, he left him with a warning, and a few days later, his wife was reported dead. The lesson, Mike says, is that he took a half measure when he should have taken a full measure, and this inspires Walt to conspire against Gus without knowing just how loyal Mike is to the man. So Mike, who was actually looking to discourage Walt from continuing to associate with Jesse, accidentally signed his boss's death sentence, and this isn't the first time that one of Mike's mistakes would come back to bite him. Because what the hell was that? Exactly. You might want to hold off. Yeah? Season 3 ends with Walt playing both Gus and Mike, 
making himself indispensable to them by killing off his own replacement, something Mike didn't foresee. And you'll see how this becomes a thing with him across both shows. So Mike is forced to keep Walt alive, even though he was sent to the laundry by Gus to eliminate him, following his highly erratic behavior. Mike stays composed for the rest of the episode, but it's clear he was on the edge, and that boils over in the season 4 premiere, where Gus silently slits Victor's throat for getting made at Gail's apartment. Mike is shocked to see this, and actually draws his weapon on Gus in his disbelief, but the message is very clear, screw up one more time, and this will be the fate of everyone in the room. So, Mike spends the rest of Season 4 working exclusively for Gus. By this point, we've already figured out that Mike's true allegiance lies with Gus, not Saul. After all he did was threaten to break his legs and leave him in a hole in the desert if he didn't give Jesse up. Don't make me beat you till your legs don't work. Now tell me where to find him. But he doubles down on this and gets to work preparing for an all-out war. He first assists Gus in winning Jesse over to their side, as he is the only thing keeping Walt alive, and once Jesse gives his approval for eliminating him, Mike wouldn't have to spend all weekend cleaning it up after Heisenberg's mess. In the process, he develops a strong connection with the kid, and becomes almost like a guardian for Jesse, protecting him from literally life-threatening situations on a couple of occasions. Get comfortable, kid. We may be here a while. The second is that he works as Gus's primary security guy in his plot to take out the entire cartel in one fell swoop. Mike is the only other person who knows about the plan besides Gus, as Jesse thought he was going to spend his entire life in Mexico after he met with Don Eladio and realized why he was there in the first place. But Mike assured him that either they all go home or none of them do and turns out it was the former. Mike, Gus, and Jesse make it out alive of Don Eladio's hacienda, but Mike is severely wounded in the process, which takes him out of commission for a while. He wasn't gone for too long, but he was gone long enough for Walt and Jesse to make their play to kill Gus, and tragically, they succeeded. Mike rushed back to kill Walt as soon as he realized what had happened, but was forced to play ball with him when the feds took all his money. Mike starts visibly unraveling under the pressure of keeping his guys whole whilst grappling with the fact that he might not leave his granddaughter anything, and that in the end, it was all for nothing. This leads him to making several slip-ups. He concludes that Todd is not a problem after doing a background check on him, which we know is not the case. He continues to keep the Gus-associated lawyer on his payroll, despite Saul's accurate advice that the guy would eventually flip, which is what gets the cops on Mike's case ultimately. And he goes against his better judgment and works with Walt and Lydia, two people he clearly and openly despises, and it ends up getting him and all his guys killed. This whole thing could have been avoided. Shut the fuck up. Let me die in peace. In the end, Mike isn't even given the dignity of being buried. He's dissolved the same way Walt has taken care of all of his victims, and guess his code of honor and stringent way of life really was for nothing in the end. Mike Ermentrout in Breaking Bad is a case study of how trying to convince yourself that you are more than what you do will almost always land you six feet under. Mike constantly undermines the very advice that he gives out, doesn't have the genius level foresight that Gus and Walt have, despite being extremely smart in his own right, and even though he knows his role, he takes no joy in playing it for Heisenberg at the very least. In three seasons, we see this grumpy yet lovable old grandpa slash ex-cops creed consume him, and eventually end up getting him killed. And yet, somehow, his backstory expansion in Better Call Saul adds a thousand more layers of tragedy to this already tragic character arc. The next time you bring a gun to a job without telling me, I will stick it up your ass sideways. From a parking booth attendant to reluctant cartel enforcer, the story of why Mike sells his soul. Mike is introduced in Better Call Saul as a parking booth attendant for the courthouse, and it's immediately clear to us that this isn't the same Mike that we know from Breaking Bad. Sure, he still possesses the same character traits. His epic tussle with Jimmy over parking stickers will remain one of the best running gags in the franchise. But the clear difference here is that Mike chooses to go the extra mile to avoid violence. The rules for parking validation are actually pretty simple. Most people get it on the first try. He moved to Albuquerque because he wanted to be close to his granddaughter Kaylee and daughter-in-law Stacy, but his entire life is ruled over by guilt and despair. Mike's son Matt passed away rather tragically a few months before their arrival in Albuquerque, and he is determined to provide for the family that he has left. He wasn't dirty! God damn you! 
You get that through your head! In particular, he loves his granddaughter Kaylee and would do anything to see her have a bright future, but after what happened to Maddie, which we will get to in another section, Mike is simply broken. He takes odd jobs as muscle and security for shady dealings from the veterinarian Dr. Caldera, and while he is on one of those jobs, he comes across a man who would change his life entirely, and not for the better. During his first business deal with Daniel Wormold, Mike squares up to a guy called Ignacio Varga, yes, that Ignacio Varga from that one scene in Breaking Bad, who tries to short price because he's doing this deal for some extra cash under his own boss's nose. Mike calls him out on this and makes sure that he gets his due, because he has done a lot of legwork and discovered that Nacho is connected to the Salamanca family, and his performance here impresses Nacho so much that he tries to hire Mike to take out his partner Tuco. Yes, that Tuco. But Mike refuses. Give me your wallet. Let's just stay calm here. <laughs> you see me sweating, bitch? Wallet. He does consider getting the job done, going so far as to give Lawson a visit. But he decides that he does not want to commit violence, and instead arranges to get Tuco arrested for a long time. This begins his unfortunate association with the cartel, because after Tuco leaves him looking like a squashed watermelon, he's visited by Hector Salamanca, who tries to get him to take on Tuco's gun charges for the prominent fee of $5,000. This is more money than Mike has ever earned from a job recommended by the doctor, but he refuses because he doesn't play ball with bloodthirsty maniacs. But Mike underestimates the kind of drive that Hector possesses to see his nephew released. The cousins show up at the motel where Mike is supervising Kaylee and threaten to kill his entire family, which flips a switch in Mike's head, and he decides to buy that gun he previously refused to take. Mike goes to Hector's ice cream shop and negotiates a deal for himself. He will take on Tuco's gun charges, but only only if he gets $50,000 in cash. Hector, being the madman that he is, applauds Mike's huevos and cuts the deal with him, but Mike is left with a sour taste in his mouth, so he decides to hit one of the Salamanca's trucks and steal their money, still going the extra mile to not engage in direct violence. Isn't that right? Driver had nothing to do with it. Then who? Just me. You're telling me you did this without someone on the inside? That all stops when he finds out from Nacho that Hector killed the Good Samaritan who rescued the driver that Mike had left alive, and he makes his business with Salamanca even more personal. Mike follows Hector into an Indian reserve and is poised to kill him with his rifle, but at the last possible second, he is stopped when someone trips his car horn and leaves a note for him that simply states, Don't. This is how his relationship with Gus Fring begins. Mike tracks Gus down because 1. He stopped him from killing the man who threatened his family, and 2. He tracked him without his knowledge, which should have been impossible. At first he considers the man to be just another drug dealer, whose opposition is the Salamancas, and he wants someone to help him handle things. I may make an observation. Perhaps you are trying to correct something which cannot be corrected. Mike clearly does not want to be a button man for anyone, but he is slowly convinced by Gus to join him anyway, because he explains to Mike that he, more than anyone else, knows revenge better than anyone else. And so, Mike becomes part of Gus's inner circle, working as the intermediary between him and Nacho, taking out more trucks for the Salamancas, and generally taking care of any and all security concerns for the man. But things take a rather dangerous turn for him when he meets Werner Zeigler, the man who designs the very meth lab that Walter White would one day cook in. Mike strikes up a genuine friendship with the architect over the eight months that they spend working together, but is forced to face his own mistakes when Werner pushes his hand. So far, Mike has been able to use information and intimidation to get people off his back, even give out a few lessons to novices like Price, but all his skills were wasted on a man who didn't understand the position he was in. Werner, like Price, was a civilian at the end of the day, and because he didn't understand just how serious the game he was involved in was, decided to take Michael's friendship as his personal suit of armor, which would turn out to be a disaster for both of them. Having avoided killing anyone thus far, Mike is driven to despair over what he has done to Werner, and he starts drinking in excess and lashing out at his family members. It takes a beatdown, a stabbing, and a round of rehab with Dr. Barry Goodman for Mike to fully commit to Gus's organization and that's when he comes head to head with Lalo Salamanca. Mike had already been wary of Lalo for a while, and the Werner incident had left him extra vigilant. Yo,
throughout Season 5, he moves the pieces into position for Lalo to get arrested and then bailed out, all on Gus's orders. He does defy Gus when he goes after Lalo personally after finding out that Lalo has broken into Jimmy's home, but he doesn't have to pull that trigger thanks to Kim. But things are not looking good for Mike's soul heading into the final few episodes of Season 6. In the first part of Better Call Saul's final season, Mike was seen pleading Nacho's case with Gus, trying to convince the latter to spare Nacho's life instead of using him as a pawn in his quest for revenge. But ultimately, all Mike can do is assure Nacho that he will personally look after his dad, being unable to help save the guy like he had intended to. Your dad's gonna be okay. How do you know? and Mike also fails to produce acceptable results against Lalo because he rushes to protect Jimmy instead of thinking ahead and prioritizing Salamanca, which has put him on thin ice with Gus. When Mike chastises Gus for taking on Lalo by himself, Gus simply reminds him of his own mistakes by telling him that things could have gone differently had Mike just done things Gus's way. And that's where we leave him for now, but let's look at how he got to this point in his life. You're silly, Pop-Pop. Well, a little. But he'd probably knock everything over, plus there's that big nose of his. Mike's corrupt and tortured past explored. Mike was born in the 1940s and has known hardship his entire life. According to a story he told Werner about his dad, that all his old man left him was an apartment with a stack of bills, so a young Mr. Ermintrout was determined to make something of himself from a young age. This childhood detail explains why Mike is willing to go as far as he does for money. He grew up in poverty and doesn't want his loved ones to go through what he did, so he does what he does for the greater good. At some point in his life, presumably during his 20s, Mike enrolled in the US Marine Corps and joined the Vietnam War as an intelligence operative. We say this because some of the intel missions that Mike conducts for Gus are marine grade missions, and he still manages to execute them with surgical precision, implying that his skills at intelligence gathering are something he has possessed for a long, long time. And Mike also personifies the two core sayings about the marines. Every marine is a rifleman, and once a marine, always a marine. Though he doesn't go advertising the latter fact to people on a daily basis. We find out about Mike's involvement in Vietnam through a brief conversation he has with Lawson, where he reveals that he used that M40 bolt-action sniper rifle when it still used to have wooden stocks, something only the first batch of Marine deployed to Vietnam were carrying. So Mike was one of the 700 Marines who received the M40 as their active duty service rifle, and he knows its strength and flaws inside out. After returning from Vietnam following nearly a decade of service, Mike joined the Philadelphia Police Department as a beat cop and served for 30 years on the force. During this time, he got married, had a son, and was blessed enough to see him get married and have a granddaughter as well. These are for you. What about the rest? The rest are for me. No, they're not. You're too old for balloons. Uh -huh. But Mike wasn't as great as he made himself out to be to his family. He was a crooked cop who was peer pressured into accepting bribes and running protection rackets in Philly. And this was a fact he kept from everyone, including Matty, who himself had become a cop wanting to follow in his father's footsteps. Matt put Mike on a pedestal and worshipped him as a figure of pure justice. So when his own department's officers began pressuring him into taking bribes, he went to Mike for a solution. Mike broke his son by revealing he was down in the gutter with the rest of them, and encouraged him to take the money lest he be killed out of suspicion. But it didn't matter. Matt died because he showed hesitation in accepting the bribes, and this broke Mike as well. Don't call. Before he died, don't bullshit me. It was between me and my son. He tracked down the police officers who'd killed Matt, and enacted his revenge on him. This is part of the reason why he left Philly to go to Albuquerque, but Mike's guilt kept weighing in on him for the better part of four seasons, because he chose not to talk about it. The outburst he has on Stacy and Kaylee is not justified, and he says some rather horrible things to them, but Mike realizes it's because he has not processed his own feelings towards Maddie's death, and his hand in it. I was down in the gutter with the rest of them. He confesses his sins to Stacy, who chooses to forgive him, and from that point onwards, Mike gets his head back on straight and goes to work once again for his family. Only this time, he keeps his crap to himself. 
Mike's time with the Marines and the Philly PD has given him invaluable experiences in how to operate on both sides of the law. He can take out four trained gunmen without breaking a sweat, and even has a police radio that he uses to manipulate the Albuquerque PD. But it was also shaped him into the man he is today. The reason we don't see Mike kill someone in Better Call Saul, unless he absolutely has to, is Maddie. Mike doesn't want to go to that dark place again but he clearly does, because something happens between Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul that makes him ditch his no-killing rule and become far less emotional about his job. This is exemplified by the relationships he has with characters across both shows. <sighs> that all you got? <laughs> Mike's sons and his relationship with Jimmy is the key to figuring out why he broke bad. To be fair, you guys, Mike has never been clean in this franchise. He has always been portrayed as a broken figure, but one with a strong moral code, at least in Better Call Saul, that is. Dude, this is my babysitter, Aaron. Aaron, this is my grandpa, Mike. Nice to meet you. In season one, Mike gives Price a speech about criminals. He says that being on either side of the law does not correspond to one's innate goodness, because he has seen good criminals and bad cops, even been one himself. He argues that if someone must be a criminal, then they should always do their homework and be cognizant of the fact that they are indeed criminals. He also says that if you make a deal with somebody, then you hold up your end and he goes the extra mile to refund half of what Nacho paid him to kill Tuco, because he was going to get out sooner than either of them expected him to. So Mike has a clear sense of honor and even justice in a twisted way during Better Call Saul. He is more human in the prequel series, which is what makes his eventual detachment from all things not titled Ermintrout so disturbing. What the... Son of a... This is exemplified by three key relationships that run parallel to each other across both shows, but the way Mike approaches them is what makes the difference. After losing Maddie, Mike has a hole inside of him that only his granddaughter Kaylee seems capable of filling, but he does develop two father-son type relationships in both shows. The first one we see is the relationship he has with Jesse, which goes from one extreme to the other. Initially, Mike was willing to let Jesse die because he saw him as a loose cannon, and was even confused as to why Gus would want to work with the kid in the first place after disavowing him as a junkie. But he gradually comes to see Jesse as a respected peer, and gives him the most sane advice out of any of his other associates. Only you can decide what's best for you, Jesse. Not him, not me. Mike is the one who tells Jesse that he would go to Alaska if he wanted to get out of the game, which is where he ends up going to at the end of El Camino. But his relationship with Jesse is much more restrained compared to the one he had with Nacho Varga. With Nacho, Mike is far more directly involved, and you can really see how that ends up affecting him. Initially, he doesn't think much of Nacho, as he's just another guy running a deal out of his regular crew to him. But once he gets involved with the Salamancas and Gus himself, he becomes Nacho's only friend in the cartel. Mike tries his best to get Gus to spare Nacho, but Nacho dies anyway, and this teaches Mike that his standing with his employer goes only so far. Say it. I woke up, I found her, that's all I know. I woke up, I found her, that's all I know. So when Breaking Bad rolls around, he has no problem calling Jesse a craphead and beating him around until the kid learns the ropes because he now knows how important that sort of thing can be to the uninitiated. The second relationship is the one he shares with Werner Zeigler and Walter White. Werner is the first crackpot genius that Mike comes in contact with, and he is instantly taken by the German engineer's passionate nature. Mike and Werner even become friends, with Werner revealing to Mike that his surname was a German surname, and it means strength. Mike, in turn, becomes Werner's crutch during this time away from his beloved wife, but Werner takes advantage of Mike's leniency and escapes the warehouse, an act that ends with Mike having to kill a man he respected. So when he meets Walter, he feels a kinship with him because what they do, they do for their families, but he never makes an attempt to become his friend. You need to listen to me. No, Walter, the last thing I need to do is listen to you. Now sit down. In fact, Mike is the only person openly disdainful of Walt's ego, and he doesn't flinch from trying to kill Walt on multiple occasions, which is a stark contrast from his relationship with Werner. This goes to show you that the lesson he learned from Zeigler was never get too friendly with a civilian adjacent to the game, because they will almost always turn out to be erratic elements. And the last change relationship that reflects Mike's character shift is the one he has with Jimmy McGill and Saul Goodman. And we separate the two here because Mike is one of 
the rare individuals to interact with both of them, and we can see who he cares about more. Even though Mike is mostly annoyed with Jimmy whenever he encounters him, it's clear that he cares for the guy. Mike hires Jimmy as his go-to lawyer, and runs a scam with him on some Philadelphia cops who had come by to investigate his involvement with the death of those officers he mentioned earlier. He goes to Jimmy again to amend his statement about Tuco's gun, and we know that by the time Breaking Bad rolls around, Mike entrusts Jimmy implicitly in all criminal matters. But Mike also rushes to Jimmy's side twice when he finds out that he is under threat from Lalo. He goes out of his way to protect Jimmy in the Season 5 episode Bagman because they're friends, and he even uses Jimmy to scout Gus before working with the guy because he trusts him. Compare this with the scene where Mike threatens Saul if he doesn't give up Jesse, and you can see the contrast clear as day. Mike has had a longer working and personal relationship with Jimmy than he has with Gus. Surely he must know about the little trip he took with Tuco out in the desert by the time 2008 comes around. But Mike invokes the specific imagery of Tuco assaulting the Skater twins to intimidate Saul into action. He tells him that he will break his legs till they don't work, and that he trusts the hole in the desert that he would leave him in if he doesn't give up Jesse. This is a word-for-word -word description of what went down when Saul managed to talk down Tuco from killing the skateboard scammers, which is what makes us beg the question as to why Mike would threaten his friend by invoking one of his worst traumas. The answer might lie somewhere in Kim. In Season 6, Mike tells Kim that Lala is alive, not Jimmy, because he thinks she is made of sterner stuff. It is Kim who shows up at Gus's house intending to kill him on Lalo's orders, and Mike once again takes the initiative to interact with her and get the information he needs out of her. He is there with Jimmy Selling now. monkers at your apartment? Yes, he sent me! He, he wanted to send Jimmy! So far, he has shown he trusts her more than Jimmy, and that is solely based off one interaction she had with Lalo, where she managed to make him stand down. That was in stark contrast with Kim's behavior in Season 6, Episode 8, where she is having a nervous breakdown pretty much from start to finish. It's possible that Kim breaks under the pressure of anxiety and tries to go to the cops with the information she has on Gus's business, because she does recognize that he was her mark even after encountering a decoy and that makes her a very loose end indeed. It's possible that Kim is the last bit of Mike's humanity, that he will end up sacrificing for the sake of his family, and that that is how he becomes so detached by the time Breaking Bad rolls around. But we're going to have to wait and watch. For now, all we can say is that something happens that makes Mike give up on his code of honor and commit himself fully to Gus, and it has to be very personal to have changed him to his degree. Whether we're right or not remains to be seen. We will handle this. You called Tyrus, get him to the condo now. You said you were watching us. Where were you? Marvelous Verdict Mike Ehrmantraut is one of only four characters to appear across all Breaking Bad Universe productions, and with good reason. He is a man who has literally seen it all, and is the closest thing to a Shakespearean lead in his franchise. He is a strong leader who has everything on lock and is completely in charge of things, until his fatal flaw rears its head and ruins it all for him in the end. Mike is a character that is mostly seen scowling, but Jonathan Banks manages to milk all kinds of emotions from that one expression that makes Mr. Ermintraut seem both human and inhuman at the same time. Mike is the definition of a heart in conflict with itself, and that is what has made his character such a delightful addition to the franchise. Here's hoping Mr. Banks finally snags that long overdue Emmy, because he most certainly deserves it. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks everyone. We were just supposed to scare you, that's all. You try harder next time. Get out.